Oh my gosh. Well, thank you, Pamela. And I guess it's only appropriate that the first slide is exactly the place where I met you, not just in Iquitos, but actually in the canopy walkway that's outside of Iquitos. And Pam spent, gosh, a long time, maybe two weeks sitting up in this 125 foot high walkway. The platform is right in front of where I'm standing there. And uh, we broadcast to millions of kids, fifth, sixth and seventh graders in a program called the Jason Project headed up with Bob Ballard, who was down in the forest floor in an air conditioned room, I might add, <laughs> while Pamela and I were getting hit by sweat bees <laughs> big time, but we there and measuring her bivery and doing our research and she was a rock star and um, in turn she too has been a role model for all those young kids around the world because that was her backyard and she was exploring it with me on this program which was pretty cool. So um, I did want to give a shout out to tree climbing. I uh, wondered if everyone who's climbed a tree can raise their hand. <laughs> Maybe it's a lot of you. I hope Karen has. <laughs> Maybe she hasn't, um, but anyway, this is the Meglom and Treetops Camp in my hometown, which is very economically underserved. So I go up there every summer and uh, give some of these kids, most of whom live in trailers, a little chance to think harder about science and maybe empowerment. Because you know there are good reasons why maybe kids should climb trees. It is pretty empowering, and I think it's really great for girls in general. So there are some of my little rock stars from upstate New York. Um, and I've done some a lot of workshops down here in Sarasota, Florida. I'm really just down the road from you guys, but COVID is preventing us from getting together. But maybe some of you will venture down and go to the canopy walkway we have here at Mayaka River State Park because canopies are very social distanced and perfect for research and ecotourism because nobody wants to have a hundred people on a walkway in the same little spot at the same time. So it's been a kind of a neat little opportunity for these kinds of ecotourism ventures to get stronger and better. Um, I want today to just give a little background to this world of canopy science. It is pretty new and it's surprising. This is at my home forest and for a lot of us who grew up in the temperate zone, I think it inspired us to think harder about questions that we could ask in the tropics. And I also want to just say quickly, I have all of my publications on my website. I am not going to share a lot of data slides with you guys. You can look them up. You don't want to sit here and zoom and see graphs. I can't imagine anything more boring. And if you were home looking at graphs, you would probably go get a gin and tonic and not even listen to my presentation. So I really want to talk and discuss some of the things that I feel are important coming out of my lifetime of tropical rainforest research and maybe share those ideas with those of you who are embarking on this journey as scientists, because there are a lot of things I never thought about when I was just in graduate school, but now I do. And so I think it's important to jumpstart you guys. The tropical rainforest is going away pretty rapidly. So I think business as usual is not an option, but I'm giving a little homage here to those temperate forests that did inspire a lot of us. And I guess as some of you know, um, I grew up in a pretty small town. I was a really shy kid. And um, there I am with my fifth grade wildflower collection that I entered into the science fair and got a second prize and thought I was Marie Curie for sure. But you know, those moments are far and few between, especially because I think I was the only girl at the whole science fair. And um, in those days, it just wasn't the done thing. I never had a woman science teacher, actually. So I do, Pamela's right, you know, try to spend a a lot of time mentoring women in science, as well as boys, because I'm the mother of two sons. And um, so I think it's important for all genders to yeah. understand science, to do science. And especially right now in the, our country, we need to create a lot more trust in science. So those are pretty daunting challenges for all of you who might go into this field and hopefully do more than collect wildflowers. But it sure was a fun way to spend my childhood the other little secret about my growing up is that my next door neighbor was this really weird guy. We were both the two weirdest kids in our high school. I collected wildflowers and bugs and he made blue jeans and sold 
t-shirts and his name was Tommy Hilfiger. And so the funny thing is that, you know, both of us were about the only people that ever left our small town. And of course, if you have a choice between fashion and science, I would do the fashion because I think he could probably afford to save half the rainforest of the world. But it just goes to show you never know what your friends might become. So be nice to everybody. And uh, Tommy's writing a cover review for my book. So that's been really fun just because Again, I would be foolish not to want to try to get diverse people to read a book about the canopy. I don't want to have just scientists reading my book. So in some ways, he can open a lot of doors for me. And I'm still waiting for this fashion line of canopy clothing to come out, but I'm not sure there's an audience for that yet. <laughs> and that's his sister in the middle. She's my best friend to this day. Um, so what's going on? We all, I think, have this appalling and humbling view of really what is happening to our rainforests. Um, I was interviewed by the BBC last fall for one of their programs with the one question, what happens if all the trees in the world disappear? And I think we all know the answer to that, but most human beings <laughs> No, most of the public doesn't really get it and they don't really understand that, you know, losing forests in California, Australia, Brazil, Siberia, all of these other places where we've had huge fires and excessive clearing is truly a disastrous event for our planet. And it makes me as a scientist think to myself, we really need to do things differently. Um, one of the canopy uh, conferences in India about 10 years ago where Tom Lovejoy gave a keynote talk and Kamal Bawa and a couple other really great names in the trade. Um, the first chapter of the proceedings was a couple of uh, biologists from Texas and Mexico who did a little survey and found out that, you know, there was no correlation between the amount of data and publications a country hosted and the amount of conservation of their forests. In other words, we're just, you know, kind of a little worried that maybe collecting data and publishing papers in our scientific journals is <clears throat> turning the trajectory around for the governments, for the public, for the citizens in general. And so I think it's a time to look and see how can we try to do some different things in addition to our data collection. We can't stop doing great science, but I think we really have to try hard to diversify our portfolios as scientists. And so that's what I wanted to discuss a little bit today. Um, here's one of my students, Anthony Ambrose from Berkeley, because I just spent five years out in California at the Cal Academy of Sciences. And, you know, Anthony is just starting his own nonprofit so that he can really make a difference. And, to be a non-conventional scientist, but he's the guy that uh, discovered with, along with a, a, a lab at Berkeley that fog actually directly goes into the foliage of redwoods and shortcuts that long 300 foot straw effect. So there's all kinds of cool things that they're doing for research, but now they're gonna try to turn it into some bigger and better conservation programs for California, which will be fun. But I want to just run through where we are and how we got there, um, because I think it is important to realize that our studies of the whole tree are very new. In the 1950s, even in the early 1960s, when I was just starting to read things like the great big research projects at El Yunque in Puerto Rico, everybody did forestry research from the ground. And most people picked up leaves from the ground or they took pictures from the ground or even worse, they cut a tree down to look at the top of it. So you can imagine that for about 200 years, in the US in particular, who views ourselves as very, you know, sophisticated forest scientists, we really weren't studying the whole tree in any way, shape or form. And it was only when these crazy people, a couple of us made harnesses out of seatbelt webbing and welded a slingshot in my case, or used a crossbow in um, the case of some of my peers in Costa Rica, um, that we ended up going to the top of a tree. And that was a pretty simple piece or two of equipment, um, not a big deal. The single rope techniques were really the beginning of this world of the arbor knot. Um, that term was not applied until labor, later, but astronauts, of course, study outer space, 
arbor not study the tops of trees, but I think it's pretty amazing to realize that, you know, we had scuba gear in the 1950s that opened up coral reef exploration. We went to the moon in the 1960s, but we never climbed trees in our own backyards to survey and study them until the 1980s and onwards. So the field of canopy science is about 40 years old and there's a lot to be discovered, a, a huge lot to be discovered. Um, so we have now access to all of these extraordinary big trees, which is really fun. Here's Wendy Baxter and one of those fabulous giants out in uh, Humboldt County in California. And we have giant trees all around the world that no one ever went to. Here's one of my teams in Taiwan. Taiwan is fabulous for tall trees, as is Australia. And of course, the Amazon has very few left. Those great Cape Buck or Saba pentander trees are few and far between. But um, with this very simple gadget called single rope techniques, we can get up into almost any tree, anywhere, anytime. So that led us to realize that probably half of the species in the world live in the tops of trees. So that's a pretty extraordinary amount. And according to conversations I've had with Ed Wilson, we probably figure that 90% of that has yet to be classified or really understood or numbers known or anything about them. So we have a pretty huge void still in the world of forests even though we now know because of whole tree research that forests are critical for keeping us alive. So we've got a lot of catching up to do and we have to do it pretty quickly if we're going to have any success. Um, for the general public, they're always astounded. I try my best now to speak at business schools or corporate groups because they are clueless about the fact that carbon is stored in trees and medicines came from trees and that tree canopies cleanse water and make the quality of fresh water much better to drink. And of course they are clueless about the fact that half of the species in the world live up there. So we have to really do a blitz on sharing this type of knowledge with diverse stakeholders all the time. I think if we're going to turn around forest conservation in any effective manner. Um, so to do that, of course, we started developing a few more tools in the world of arbor nuts. And after the single rope techniques, uh, we saw the introduction of these canopy walkways, which made it much more accessible. This, um, this provided a lot more equity for people to access the canopy. And I was part of a little uh, wine drinking event in Australia one night when the head of an ecotourist lodge and I designed this walkway on the back of a napkin having drunk a great bottle of Australian red wine and ended up building this in southern Queensland as the first ever canopy walkway open to the public. There had been some kind of crazy structures for Operation Drake out of Oxford and some of the other research expeditions over time, but not a full-fledged public walkway. And soon after, Lambeer National Park got its walkway designed by Elar Mule, who's unfortunately passed away recently. Um, and lo and behold, we started building these structures, which allowed people with wheelchairs or little children or whole families to access the canopy and appreciate it rather than just having one person dangle from a rope. Um, here is my ACA. I hope all of you have been there. You should be raising your hands if you have because it's two hours down the road from Gainesville and a half a million people visit this walkway a year. It's <coughs> responsible for about $25 million or more of income to Sarasota County just because people invest in hotels and restaurants when they come here. And it's a fabulous way to share the Florida forests with all the school kids here who have never, of course, seen the view from the top and never quite appreciated something like an epiphyte that lives in the tops of trees. So this very simple structure, it costs $150,000, really turned around a lot of people's perspective about Florida forests, which is really great. Um, these third graders, some of you older faculty like me might remember, but we did a survey and found these kids found an invasive weevil eating some of the bromeliads and lo and behold, they got to be published at the age of 10. So I do all, always tell kids, you know, you don't have to have a PhD probably to be a scientist. You just have to have really great powers of observation. And that's what these kids did for their little third grade homework is 
draw bromeliads and they kept drawing these holes in the leaves and these little bugs on top and lo and behold they were responsible for um, uh, some publications by myself and Frank and a few others from Gainesville that were able to classify that weevil. So it's kind of a neat story and it just shows you that canopy access can provide um, new data sets, which is really important. Um, the world of canopy science also saw the um, initiation of construction cranes, starting with Panama in the early 1990s. And since then, we have about 10 around the world, but they cost a million bucks or so. And then they cost more to get unionized drivers for the crane. So they haven't caught on as much and as easily because most countries can't afford that kind of money in their forestry research budgets. But they're fabulous if you have access to one and do allow a lot of really close up uh, access to all the leaves or all the lizards or all the insects within the range of the crane arm. And the fourth tool for the Arbornaut world is, of course, this inflatable set designed by the French uh, Radeau de Seam is the sort of collective name of all the expeditions that were headed up by Francis Halle for many years. And it comes with a hot air balloon, a lovely raft, as you can see here, that's being moved and affixed to the top of that cardboard tree in Cameroon and um, a little sled as well that we can use to move through the canopy just the same way that you might sample plankton on a coral reef from by towing nets around on a boat, we can use this sled to be towed around the canopy and sample for pollinators or sample for flowers or whatever it is, vine species, anything in any question for the very uppermost parts of the trees can be addressed using some of this equipment. Um, there I am coming up, you can see me at about one o'clock through from the forest floor to work on this raft at night. It has a trampoline. And of course, one of the amazing things I found during my early graduate work is that most insects feed on leaves at night. That's what I call hit you over the head science. It makes sense, of course, that they would try to avoid bird predation by day by feeding at night. And we even had these cute little Velcro uh, hand uh, if, uh, operations where you could stick your hand through and grab a bug or grab a leaf or do whatever you had to do, or you could dangle off the edge of the raft to collect specimens. Um, so that was a great way for me to work at night using this base camp up in the canopy. And now, of course, we're getting into a whole new era. We've got LIDAR, we've got ASU's fabulous setup with Greg Asner and others to do broader imagery and really amazing overviews of forests. This is use of drones down in the Amazon by some of my students. Um, but as Greg Asner always reminds me, you know, we still need ground truthing and it's not quite ground, but we still need climbers and people to get up close to all of these surveys because if we detect uh, an outbreak of insects, we still have to find out what the insect is and how many and get a little bit of a close up on their biology. So the days of climbing the actual trees is far from over, but those new techniques certainly do add to our knowledge base, which is really great and exciting. And from all this whole tree research, rather than a focus on the forest floor, we now recognize, of course, that trees are absolutely essential for life. And we now have a much better sense of carbon storage. We have a better sense of the dynamics of the canopies and the productivity and all of the interesting climate impacts that trees have and whole forests have on controlling the destiny of humans as well as all of the planet in general. So it's a pretty significant time, I think, to think harder about how we should spend our time studying these amazing systems and what types of outcomes we hope we might have. Um, so with that, I do want to talk a little bit about using these canopies in some way that um, becomes a bit charismatic. Let's face it, it's a fabulous thing to have a science where most people did it as kids. A little bit of tree climbing plays into most people's lives. And this is still a very huge focus on a lot of ecotourism in the tropics. So maybe there are ways we can use this canopy knowledge to the betterment of saving forests. Um, and this is the same walkway that Pamela and I did the Jason project on. This uh, picture here just illustrates the 
depth and breadth of one of these experiences. And this kind of inspired me. I did a little economic survey in like 2008 and 2009. It's published in Biotropica where I took three walkways and figured out how much money it was bringing into the community, how many people were employed and what was the prognosis for conservation. And this walkway alone was hiring 117 families every year at the time I did that publication who were guides, cooks, ecotourist lodge operators, and he had a very sustainable income at that, which was so different from the logging industry. And so it not only provided all those local families with sustainable income, but it also allowed that whole area to grow in its conservation status from about a thousand hectares to now over a million hectares because all the people were really invested in understanding that they needed birds for the bird watchers to come and they needed a healthy canopy for the tourists to keep coming. So that's been for me a real inspiration to think more about how could I apply some of these canopy tools to conservation in a more effective way? And this is that part of the Amazon now, the walkways off in the left-hand corner right over here. And this whole area is now really very well conserved because the people are so invested, the locals are so diligently invested in the conservation and don't respect poaching or anything else. Um, so this is caught on in other places. Here's a recent walkway that I was just uh, really honored to be part of. Um, and this one was for me an achievement in two ways. One is a corporate sponsor funded it. So there was only one check and it took about an hour to convince this guy to write that check. And you think about how many NSF grants you write and then someone criticizes them and then you write them again. And you probably spend about three years of your life writing grants or maybe 10 if you're as old as me. Um, and over time, what does that really do for the rainforest? Is probably not too much. Um, so addressing this corporate entity and having them fund this entire walkway, which cost about $3 million, and then fund a park around it, which cost about $10 million, was, I think, a fabulous outcome. And this is in Penang in Malaysia. And right now it attracts about 2 million visitors a year. It has the potential to attract 2 million local people as well. The city of Georgetown in the Penang region has about 5 million people. And then the entire area is very popular for tourism. So this kind of gave me an idea thinking about the Amazon and now thinking about places like Malaysia that are so, so desperately needing conserving that how can we maybe create models out of this and, and create a way to do this better. And on this note, um, I became the science advisor for this corporate entity. And out of that, we funded 100 scientists to come, 117 to be exact, um, and do a biodiversity blitz there. Um, they funded a proceedings that's just getting published next month. Um, and they absolutely are funding now through their foundation, which you should look up if you're a student, the Habitat Foundation um, is funding graduate students and postdocs to come over and do research on this walkway. So everything is leading to something better and we're taking all the data and we just put in a UNESCO World Heritage nomination for this entire quarter of Penang Island, which because of this canopy walkway will hopefully become a forest preserved in perpetuity. So uh, that's a lot of good out of this one walkway in this one check that took one hour to convince a guy to write. So again, just a nice story that has a good ending, we hope. Um, so this has caused me to have long, long lunches with Ed Wilson, and whom I've been so honored to be mentored by. And we would sit up in the bowels of that building at Harvard and say, you know, how can we really save half Earth, which is Ed's proposal. You know, we need to save half Earth for all of biodiversity and leave the other half for one species, which is humankind. Um, so, and I also was having the uh, privilege of mentorship over many years by a lady named Sylvia Earle, who is an oceanographer and Sylvia at age 86 now still dives, but she started a program 10 years ago called Mission Blue, where she identifies hope spots in the ocean. And she brings that to the attention of communities. She 
finds funding for different places to become parks or reserves or maybe have the fishing adjusted. And so she has created almost a hundred hope spots in the blue part of the planet. And so I founded Mission Green, which is the hope of creating hot spots or identifying Ed Wilson's hot spots that he already has cited in his book, Half Earth and building canopy walkways in these critical areas that might otherwise take with them some 50% of the world's biodiversity. So you'll see the red dots representing walkways that we've already built and the yellow ones being walkways that are proposed. And I'm really happy to say that as of last week, I just got a call from Pat Wright, the lemur lady at SUNY Stony Brook, and she was all excited because we had put in a proposal together for a walkway in Madagascar and it got approved by the National Parks in Madagascar, as well as the US Embassy, as well as the government of Madagascar, who is very excited. So we're heading there in May to make the designs for this walkway. And the other fun yellow spot is here, Mozambique, of course, not surprisingly, is Gorongosa National Park is Ed Wilson's favorite, favorite place. And I did a pitch to Greg Carr, who's the dot com guy who's funding most of that work. And in, again, in one hour, he just said, let's build it. I don't care what it costs. So we're up for a walkway there as soon as we can get the materials and the team over there. So those two yellow spots are just about to change. Um, I just talked to the head of Atri in India about having a cool walkway up he, probably down here, that dot's probably a little bit off by my terrible graphics in the middle of the night. But anyway, um, we're also planning one in Bhutan and I think that's what that yellow dot is. So things are happening, which is great. And we hope that we can continue the momentum to make sure that in these places, local people get funded and trained to operate. And then students get also funded to survey the biodiversity and. I'm trying to twist Pamela's arm so we might do something together over here in the Amazon. She'd be a great trainer of indigenous people in that region. I don't know why I would ever think of her. <laughs> and um, we could be a team together again, which would be fun if we could figure out some funding to get her down there um, in the near future to use that exemplary walkway. So that's just a little bit about what I'm doing since Karen Kaner asked me that earlier, um, trying to get Mission Green off the ground. Um, I have a wonderful science advisory group that does include Ed Wilson as the chair and uh, Peter Raven and Pat Raven and um, a bunch of other folks that have been really, really great to try to guide me because this is not one of those things where we just want to raise a bunch of money and pay rent for office space and print global brochures and send them around the world. We just really want to get out there and save these forests as quickly as we can. And why do I have a little red dot down here? Well, this is kind of a joke, but I have studied the canopies of Antarctica because I work on water bears in some of my dotage when I can't climb tall trees. I figure that'll be a good thing to do. And so having studied the water bears in the canopies of mosses and lichen in Antarctica, I think we could build a walkway with toothpicks. But um, the fun thing is that when I give a lot of talks to school groups, which I do all the time, kids just love water bears and they love this concept of the canopy simply being the top of whatever the vegetation might be. So I guess I just have to keep that in there for fun. Um, so there's Ed. I want to give a big shout out to him. He's been a great inspiration. I know he probably has to a lot of you. Um, but again, this whole business of half earth is not any half. You know, if we just save the deserts and the ice flows, I don't think it's going to achieve what Ed had in mind. And he did have the vision to ask about 15 scientists, myself included, me and Stuart Pym and a bunch of others, what is the most important forest you think we should save? And he included that list in his book. Um, and so that's been my guide just to say, okay, somebody's picked these for us. The experts have already identified them. Now we need to go in and make sure we have this sustainable local economy based around these walkways to keep those species intact, which is kind of exciting. 
Oh, and there's one of those water bears just for fun. <laughs> uh, they are so cute. Only a mother could love it though, I guess. Um, anyway, I do want to also say that um, I think it's really critical for all of you as scientists, not just to think about saving your habitat and making sure that conservation is really strong wherever you work or whatever you work upon, but for those of you that can, which might be approaching 50% of your graduate students, I think as a woman in science, it's really critical that we involve women at the decision-making table. And I know this has been an issue for so many decades decades for a lot of us. Um, even today, it's hard to find boards that have more than 50% women. It's very hard to look at Fortune 500 companies and even, even find one or two female CEOs. But it's also quite ridiculous when you think of women in places like this, which is Assam in India, where I've been working, and all these women are brilliant. They know about the fish, they know about the water, they know about the pollinators, but yet they're never called upon in any way, shape, or form to use their local knowledge. So I've just made a personal commitment to myself that whenever I do field work somewhere, I need to take an activity or a project or a resource to the women who live there. Um, of late, I've been working in Ethiopia a lot, so that's been a big challenge, trying to think of ways that I could advise women that have no computers and no electricity and basically not even a book, not even a pencil. So um, I will talk about that though in a few minutes. And it is, I think that, you know, uh, the biggest challenge for environmental justice right now is not only things like providing for people in the U.S., but it's a huge, huge global issue. And on that note, um, when I go to India these days, I usually take climbing equipment and try to do a training course for girls. We've had a lot of fun over time. I have to usually take something for them to wear because they don't usually climb in those saris very easily. And I did a Fulbright um, in uh, Ethiopia, and I'll talk about that in a minute, where we had to figure out what kind of activities we could do for women that spoke Amharic. Um, this was my last NSF grant, which actually was with kids, mostly girls, I might add, in wheelchairs. Um, this is Rebecca, and she discovered eight water bears, but we just figured out how to take pulleys and adjust the hardware a little bit so that these college students who never ever thought they could do field biology could do it. And, you know, they're always relegated to those indoor tasks. And yet some of them always dreamt about being outside. And so it was a real joy for the last five summers to have a pro project um, that we could use that helped inspire uh, mobility limited students to go into the canopy. So there is hopefully something for everyone. Um, Pamela was, of course, part of that Jason project, as I mentioned before, and hopefully that helped a lot of girls uh, have a different childhood from my own, because as I said before, when I was in fifth grade, I not only had I never heard of a rainforest, but I certainly had never had a woman science teacher and never did, even in college, I never did. So I'm glad things like that are changing. But this Jason project was great because we were not only broadcasting from the rainforest, but we were doing crazy things like hosting the Duke of Edinburgh here in Belize or hosting the president of Peru at the time with Pamela and using all that crazy technology in those days like satellite dishes, whereas today, it costs about a hundredth of the cost to broadcast um, to schools around the world and museums around the world. And in fact, um, the Jason project with Pamela costs $5 million from the Amazon. And Bob Ballard did most of that fundraising. I took the Jason project to Malaysia when we built that canopy walkway in Penang and it cost me $50,000 to take a team, a laptop and have the connectivity around the world. So that shows you that we can achieve a lot of this for a lot less money, which is very exciting indeed. Um, oh yeah, here's, so here are my women in Ethiopia when I was at the largest university in Ethiopia called Jima University uh, on a Fulbright, one of my roles Goals was to mentor the women faculty. Well, this is it. They were all the women faculty that there was. And they confessed to me that women could only apply for jobs if men didn't apply. So 
these were kind of the leftover jobs and these poor girls were scared to death to talk, but we started a coffee hour and had a lot of fun sharing ideas. And I've been helping some of them get overseas scholarships or experiences to broaden their depth of knowledge. But again, these are just small jobs for those of us who do go internationally to other places, but really important to the people that live there. Um, so that brings me to my third thought, and I think you've already seen a couple examples like these corporate sponsors of some of our canopy work. I think it's also important in time to look at diverse stakeholders when we reach out for our research. And I got a lifetime lesson in this when I ended up working in Ethiopia, quite by chance, I might add. I was the treasurer of ATBC for a long time. And when we were in Moralia, Mexico, long ago and far away, say 12 years ago, um, I happened to meet the only forest conservation biology student in Ethiopia. Alamaihu Wasi Ashete, who was just had got the student prize, and I gave him the little hundred dollar check and said, Congratulations, what next? And he practically burst into tears and said, I don't know, I'm the only person working to save the forests in all of Ethiopia. So it kind of gave me a bit of a a pause in my life and I guess you know what the outcome was suddenly I found myself funding him to come to Florida and writing a grant with him for National Geographic and lo and behold I ended up being the first white person to get a memorandum of understanding from the Coptic church in Ethiopia to come and study their forests, which are pictured here. The last remaining forests of Northern Ethiopia are these little dots called church forests. And you can see it's less than 5% of the landscape. The rest of this landscape is subsistence agriculture, which they desperately need because they don't have irrigation and they don't have efficient crop yields. Um, but these little church forests, as you can see a little bit closer, are where all of their biodiversity is housed. All of the insects, all of the mammals, nothing lives out here very successfully. And for the most part, these forests are degrading because cattle come in and eat the seedlings and saplings and people plow around the edges so that makes the trees die back and get ring barks. The kids come in and pull branches down because they have no idea that the rest of their valley is dry and has no biodiversity because they don't have any aerial images like this and they certainly don't have any books in their schools or computers to give them those visions. So lo and behold, the simple solution here that that Alamaihu and I came up with was giving workshops to the priests, number one, so they would start to realize that they were living in a gold mine. And the neat thing about this is that the priests feel they are responsible for all of God's creatures. As a conservation biologist, I'm trying to preserve biodiversity. So we actually have the same mission. The, that means that church and science is a perfect match to work together. And all it required was for us to create some trust and take time together in their case to pray with them a lot. This is their currency of choice. It's not giving them money or clothing or trying to convince their government to plant eucalypt, which is what they do a lot, but it was simply being at their level and doing the things that they value. And we've built up a great relationship over those last 10 years. And they, of their own volition, wanted to save their church forests. So they figured out that they could take the stones out of the fields and the farmers were happy and they could get people to build these walls after church and they could protect the forest from the cattle and create a boundary. And even smarter, you can barely see here, they figured out if you put these walls 50 feet or 100 feet away from the current boundary, they could compensate for what was lost. So here we are blessing a wall. And um, today, um, there's all kinds of opportunity for students to go there and study the biodiversity of Ethiopia carefully. People have to be very respectful of the religious culture. But this is one of my teams that did insect surveys with National Geographic funding. And we absolutely, and not surprisingly, discovered lots of new species and data new to science and recognized what a treasure trove these places really are. And you can see the wonderful results of these healthy forests and these amazingly extreme 
arid uh, landscapes where the crops grow once a year and understand without any kind of fancy science or any technical data that these church forests are critical to the future of this entire country. Um, I've been fundraising to build these walls because it takes a little money to move the stones sometime. It takes a little money to build the gates so people can come and go. And it's really smart uh, business practice to give the church a donation when they build a wall so that we can incentivize them. And so we have a $500,000 program that's not very expensive in this world of ours to save the biodiversity of Ethiopia by walling the 40 highest biodiversity church forests. And we are over halfway there. We have about 200,000 left to raise. Um, you can go on my website, www.treefoundation.org and send me that check for $200,000. I'd be very grateful. But the amazing thing about this is most of that first 300,000 has come from fifth graders. And when I talk to kids about schools and I show them these pictures of kids in Ethiopia that are losing their forests, almost invariably they host a bake sale or they do a little artwork sale in their fifth grade class and send a check for 75 or 100 bucks and over the last few years that money has just come in from all over the world and those kids are really saving these forests not adults and not the Ethiopian government but children around the world who just really think that these kids in Ethiopia should have their stewardship of their biodiversity as part of their future. Here are all my little bug counters who come over after school and help us with our research. And it, to that end, I actually made t-shirts for all of them because most of them, as you can see, don't even own a t-shirt. They Half of them go to school in the blanket that they sleep in. So they loved getting a t-shirt with a field guide um, in Amharic. These, we put the language in both English and Amharic of what all the important pollinators were and gave them their own shirt when they were our research assistants. And the other project that I've been trying to do is I sort of really obsess on thinking, how do you educate kids who have no resources in their schools? And so I did co-author a book in their language um, with a local colleague in Ethiopia. And every time this English version is sold on Amazon.com, we fund a copy to be printed in Amharic, and then we distribute them to the kids. And I can only tell you the most joyous experience in my whole life has been giving a child the first book he or she has ever owned. And a lot of these kids are 16 and 17 years old, and they have never owned one book in their whole life. So our schools and our systems are so spoiled with funding, relatively speaking, that I think we can all think harder about how to give back in some of these countries that we work in. Um, so with that, it gives you a little sense about what's going on. I did actually have this book cover at the end, and um, as Karen mentioned, um, I could put this up. Well, I did put it up. It's being published by Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux, and you can pre-order it. Um, I'm not trying to sell my book, but what I'm trying to do is think about ways that we can sell the stories. Most of this book is about stories of how a forest scientist can invoke conservation. So I have a chapter in here about saving the forests of Ethiopia, another one about ecotourism in the Amazon, and another one about the Malaysian uh, canopy walkway in the UNESCO World Heritage. But I think the more times we can hit people over the head about how we apply our science in ways that has some outcome that people understand and probably link it to the economy of our local indigenous people, the more successful maybe our science will be. So I'm hopeful that some more corporate people would read this book um, and then they, would, they too will write a check for a walkway and maybe help us save the biodiversity of the planet. Um, so with that, um, I think I've talked way too long, but like I said, no data, just thoughts and discussion. I'd be happy to answer questions and I'd also be happy to refer you to any of my 200 publications. If you want data, I would be happy for you to see it on the website. So thank you very much. Pamela for hosting me.